One might think that the life of a conqueror as well known as Mongol imperial founder Chinggis Khan would be meticulously detailed. While Chinggis Khan certainly is a well-attested figure, before he was the great conqueror and merely Temujin Khan, outside sources did not take account of his life. Thus, most of the histories of his early life could be written after the fact, to suit the needs of Mongol imperial historiography. This episode looks at the sources on the life of Temujin and the mysterious 10-year gap that the official Mongol imperial source created, a gap he may have spent in Jin Dynasty China. Goes to show that you really have to make something of yourself to leave a legacy, and wouldn't you like to be known not only as a supporter of the world's forests, but as a lord or lady? Then check out this offer from our sponsor, Established Titles. They sell small plots of land in Scotland, which are sought after because of a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds, or lords and ladies in English. But to protect these lands, a tree is planted with every order, preserving picturesque woodland and biodiversity, and established titles supports charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. You'll get at least one square foot of land in Scotland, with a unique plot number and a certificate to prove it. This allows you to officially get Lord or Lady on your credit cards, plane tickets, and more. You can also get maps to show your new estate, including the immensely detailed, hand-drawn 1611 map by John Speed, held by the National Library of Scotland. It makes a great last-minute gift, and they even have couple packs that come with adjoining plots of land. The first 200 plots bought via our link will all be put together within a few minutes of each other next to the Kings and Generals plot. So act fast to join our little union of forest territories. Check out their early Black Friday sale for discounts. Plus, if you use our code KINGS, you'll get an extra 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash kings to get yourself a title or give it as a gift and help support the channel. One of the most interesting of all surviving inscriptions of the Jurchin-ruled Jin dynasty, 1115 to 1234, is the Serven Kalga inscription located in Bayan Kutag, Kenti Imag, Mongolia. Discovered in the 1980s and carved into a granite mountainside, the inscription is weathered and difficult to read. It consists of several lines of Jurchen text, accompanied by a translation into Chinese. They glorify a successful campaign in May or June of 1196 by the Jin commander Wen Yan Shang against the Tatars of Eastern Mongolia, here called Zubu. It's a brief victory marker over barbarian tribesmen, which is hardly uncommon in the history of Chinese dynastic monuments. It also happens to be the earliest record of an event in the life of Chinggis Khan, then known as Temujin. Though Chinggis is not named on the monument, we know of his participation in the campaign from a number of Mongol imperial sources, such as the Jami al Tawarik by the Ilkhanid historian and vizier Rashid al Din, circa 1305 the Chinese translation of the veritable records of Chinggis Khan, circa 1287, the Shengwu Qinjiang Lu, circa 1320, the Wanxi, 1370, and of course the famous Secret History of the Mongols, circa 1252. The campaign is also referred to in the Jin dynasty's own dynastic history, the Jin Shi, 1343, though from the point of view of the commander, Wen Yan Shang. Again, Chinggis Khan is unnamed. Collectively, these sources allow us to firmly date Wen Yang Shang's campaign against the Tatars to summer 1196, with Shang returning to the Jin capital of Zhongdu by the autumn. This makes it the earliest concrete date we have for an event in the life of Temujin Khan. Dating the early life of Chinggis Khan is notoriously difficult. For events before 1196, the main sources, the Secret History of the Mongols, Rashid al-Din, the Veritable Records, and Yuan Shi, generally agree on the general flow, but often differ in the actual year or order of events. The most famous of these, and the earliest surviving Mongolian history, the Secret History of the Mongols, plays particularly loose with dating, often condensing years for dramatic purposes or simply offering no dating at all. Scholarship of the last decades has come to a rough guideline for Temujin's life. 1162 is the most widely given year for his birth, though supporters remain for 1155 and 1167. 1180, give or take a year or two, saw the capture of Temujin's wife Burte by the Merkit, 
and soon after birth of their first son, Jochi. They already had a daughter, Kojinbeki. The only date of birth given for any of his sons in a medieval source is 1186 for Ugade, Temujin's third son. A few years after the rescue of Bute and birth of Jochi, circa 1180 to 1182, Temujin and his sworn ally Jemuka fell out and came to blows. The ensuing battle at Dalen Belgiot, 70 marshes, was not only the first time where the future Chinggis Khan held his own independent command, but was also a major defeat for him, despite efforts of later writers like Rashid al-Din to gloss over this. Jemuka was victorious, and in the secret history of the Mongols, boiled 70 captive princes alive after the battle, while Temujin slinked away to lick his wounds. The most usual dating for the Battle of Dalen Belgit falls between 1186 and 1190. While a minority of researchers, like Karl Sverdrup, propose a date as late as early 1194, most scholarship prefers a date in the mid-1180s, which seems to align better with the chronology within the sources. 1186-87 is perhaps the most popular suggestion. By assigning Temujin's defeat at Dalan Baljut to 1186, a new issue emerges, for the next recorded event in Temujin's life comes with the aforementioned Tatar campaign of 1196 with the Jin. Paul Rachnevsky shed light on this in his Genghis Khan His Life and Times 1991, identifying this as the 10-year gap in Temujin's life. Assuming, first of all, this chronologic reconstruction is accurate, and that there is indeed a 10-year gap from 1186 to 1196, a number of suggestions have been proposed to account for the silence. A simple explanation is that Temujin underwent a rather uncharacteristic quiet period, slowly rebuilding his support or fighting minor skirmishes with his rivals while raising his new family. More or less, nothing interesting happened from 1186 to 1196. However, as Rachnevsky noted, there is evidence that Temujin spent his dark years in China. It was not uncommon for defeated steppe leaders to seek shelter with neighboring sedentary powers such as the Jin dynasty, Tangut kingdom, Uyghurs or Karakitai. Temujin's ally, Toriel of the Karyat, did so several times. Shortly after Dalan Baljut, Toril was chased out of power by a relative named Erke Kara. Toril fled to Karakitai, then made his way through Uyghur and Tangut lands before rejoining Temujin for the 1196 campaign. After Toril's death, his son, Ilka Sengum, fled through the Tangut lands, while the Naiman prince Kuchulug, upon being defeated by Temujin, fled with his retainers to Karakitai, where he eventually usurped power. The neighboring powers were often happy to receive these nomadic lords, for they could be useful auxiliaries in their own campaigns, while installing a friendly Khan back on his throne could be protection against future raids. Furthermore, several historical sources actually directly state that Temujin spent years in China as a captive. A Franciscan friar who traveled through the Mongol Empire in the 1250s, William of Rubric, recorded Temujin being held captive by the Tangut Kingdom, while a Song Dynasty emissary in 1221, Zhao Gong, stated that Temujin spent 10 years as a slave of the Jin. Zhao Gong states that Temujin was young when this occurred, but the time there gave him great knowledge of Jin affairs, which he later put to use in his war against them. Based on the surviving evidence, that Temujin spent some or all of these years in the Jin state seems likely while also embarrassing enough that official Mongol imperial historiography felt it too shameful to comment upon, but Song envoys like Zhao Gong would have no taboos over mentioning it. As Temujin's defeat at Dalan Baljut occurred in northeastern Mongolia, a flight across the entire steppe to Karakitai or the Tangut Kingdom seems a difficult venture. The Jin were considerably closer. While Temujin had reasons to dislike the Jin, namely their role in the murder of his relation, Ambakai, such feeling could have been put aside in the face of the immediate material and political need for shelter from his rivals in Mongolia. This juxtaposition of taking shelter or vassalage with a hated enemy would certainly explain why official Mongol histories glossed over it. Contemporary sources outside of the Mongol historical tradition 
such as the Song border official Li Xinchuan and the envoy Zhao Gong, both indicate that Temujin had been a vassal of the Jin, paying them yearly tribute until the very eve of the Mongol invasion. Such a relationship was also well within Jin dynastic border policy. Unlike their predecessors, the Kitenliao dynasty, the Jin dynasty did not rule over the Mongolian plateau directly. Aside from sending a few armies into the steppe, by and large the Jin's preferred policy was to operate through Juyin peoples, that is nomadic and semi-nomadic peoples along the frontier between the steppe and the Jin dynasty, who paid tribute to the Jin and patrolled the border. The most well-known of these were the Ungut, who also manned the Jin's border fortifications in Inner Mongolia. The Tatars themselves were the Jin's regular allies in the steppes from the 1160s until the 1190s. In exchange for this allegiance, these nomadic polities received gifts, trade privileges, and official titles that enhanced the prestige of their leaders in the steppe. And when one of these groups grew too powerful or rambunctious, the Jin would back a different group and overthrow it to maintain the balance of power, as they did when they supported Temujin against the Tatars in 1196. A few sporadic mentions within Mongol imperial sources support Temujin spending time in the Jin Empire. In Rashid al-Din's account, Temujin recalls bringing Toril Khan's uncle, Jia Gambu, back from the Jin dynasty with him. Numerous official Mongolian sources refer to the 1196 campaign, and are very open about Temujin and Toril's cooperation with the Jin commander Wen Yan Shang. In the secret history of the Mongols, Wen Yan Shang sent messages to Temujin requesting his aid, and Temujin and Toril both met him in person. For their services in the battle, Toril was given the Chinese title of Wang, King or Prince, which became in Mongolian Ong and hence the epithet by which he is better known, Ong Khan. Temujin, meanwhile, was granted the title of Jaud Kuri, of uncertain etymological origin, but the general meaning is thought to be akin to centurion. The granting of both titles is recorded even in the secret history of the Mongols. This was no minor thing. The prestige of such titles was important to the reputation of steppe leaders. The name of Toril's own son, Ilka Sengum, is a Mongolized form of a Chinese title, Xiangong, meaning Lord Minister or Chancellor. It was no coincidence that Toril is better known by the title of Ong Khan than his own name. The secret history of the Mongols even includes the detail that Wen Yang Xiang was going to ask the Jin Emperor about granting an even more prestigious title on Temujin in an episode meant to enhance Temujin's importance to the reader indicating a connection beyond momentary allies. Other indirect support comes from how effective Chinggis's actual invasion of the Jin was. Chinggis showed a marked familiarity with individuals of the Jin state, such as the Emperor Wei Xiaowang, and before the invasion, there were dissidents against Jurchen rule, especially Kitans, defecting to Temujin, demonstrating he was a known figure within the Jin realm. As Zhao Gong stated, when Temujin attacked the Jin, he was no stranger to them, but had familiarized himself with their strengths and weaknesses, particularly of their military. Some of this can be accounted for by Mongol spies, such as the Muslim merchant Jafar Khodja, who traveled through Jin lands and brought back valuable intel. But it seems Temujin had his own eyewitness knowledge, which he incorporated into his planning and allowed him to overwhelm the Jin defenses. Other evidence may come from Borte continuing to bear children continually over the 1180s and 90s. There is no indication of miscarriage, and all of Temujin and Borte's nine known children lived to adulthood. Whatever Temujin was doing, Borte was still at his side, and in a safe enough position to bear and raise their children. No matter what, Temujin was not reduced to nothing after Dalan Baljut. He was able to keep his family secure in a way he'd never been able to do beforehand, something unlikely if his power was broken and he was hunted by his rivals in the steppes. Assuming Temujin did indeed flee to the Jin dynasty after 1186, then his life probably looked something like this. With his retinue, perhaps even a small army, he came to the Jin border, meeting with the Juyin border guards and sending messages to seek permission to enter the Jin dynasty. 
During this time he may have waited at the court of Ungut rulers, and with his natural charisma, made a good impression. It would explain why the Ungud were later so willing to side with Temujin against his rivals, and betray the Jin. Presumably, Temujin was brought to the capital of Zhongdu to make an official show of submission, a humiliating but valuable necessity. We cannot track his movements over the intervening years, but it seems he likely received military training or accompanied the Jin army on campaign. Up to Dalan Beljut in 1186, Temujin's military performance was mediocre, having lost the only major battle he led himself. By 1196, Temujin appears a much more confident and capable commander, able to coordinate effectively with the Jurchen army. His military actions during his stay may have ranged from bandit suppression to joining Jin armies in punitive raids in Mongolia, as the Jin did in 1195 against the Onguret. At the same time, he made connections and spoke of uprising with disaffected members of the military, particularly Ketans. Likely, Temujin spent these years hungry for news from the steppe, looking for an opportunity to rush back and claim his title. Perhaps other former allies of his steadily flocked to him when they learned he was in the Jin lands. When the Tatars arose in revolt in 1195, Temujin jumped at the chance, if the Jin court didn't already have him in mind as their new man on the ground. Once victory was achieved and the Tatars humbled, the Jin hoped to keep Temujin playing nice, delivering tribute and stopping any other nomadic power from growing too strong. Hence the Song source's description of Temujin paying tribute and recognizing the Jin emperor as overlord until his invasion. But as Mongol sources recognize no legitimate power on earth other than the one established by Chinggis Khan, it was simply inappropriate to suggest any tributary relations whatsoever. The Jin's plan might have worked too, but the ailing emperor Zhang Zong failed to pay proper heed to steppe affairs in his final years, despite the cries of concerned members of the court, like that of his uncle Wan Yan Yangji. In 1206, a massive war broke out with the Song dynasty, which demanded the Jin court's full attention. The very same year that Temujin established the Mongol Empire and took the title of Chinggis Khan. A large uprising of Khitans in the Jin dynasty and continued ecological and financial crises greatly diminished the political will of the Jin state. In late 1208, Zhang Zong of Jin died and was succeeded by Wan Yan Yangji, Wei Xiao Wang, 1208-1213. Chinggis had little respect for the man, but initially continued tribute payments. According to Li Xinchuan, when a Mongol party, perhaps including Chinggis himself, came to bring their yearly tribute to the border, Wan Yang Yangji, concerned over the Mongol unification, as well as Chinggis's attacks on the Tangut kingdom to the west, attempted to ambush Chinggis. Unfortunately for the Jin, the plan was discovered, leading Chinggis to officially cut off tribute in 1210 and invade the Jin Empire in 1211. Inadvertently, the Jin dynasty may have sheltered and given power to the force which ultimately wiped them from the map. Thanks again to our sponsor, Established Titles. Buy a small plot of land in Scotland and become a lady or a lord, or give this title as an amazing and easy gift. In return, Established Titles plants a tree to protect the pristine forests of our planet. Take advantage of their early Black Friday sale and use our discount code KINGS at establishedtitles.com slash kings to get a further 10% off. More videos on the history of the Mongols are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.